Welcome to the Recruitment Rollercoaster podcast. My name is Hisham Azuz, and today I'm joined by Harriet and Jane, who are both uh, the co-founders of a recruitment business called Trapeze HR. And um, hello, we just had to change room <laughs> to room where perils of uh, co-working. Yeah, space. so we're in a really cool co-working space um, near Liverpool Street. And um, the original room that we had, there was loads of chairs moving around upstairs. We had to move, didn't we? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we're in a better room now, and I'm excited to, to speak to the both of you. And as I was saying before we started, where I always love to, to start and begin this show is how the both of you entered the lovely world of recruitment. Please do share. I'll go first. Okay. Um, so I am an HR generalist by my background. I've worked in HR the field of HR for 25 years. Wow. Um, And as part of an HR job, a lot of recruitment is done, and I've always enjoyed the recruitment side of things. I've preferred hiring to firing, always. Um, (laughs) And it's it's something I feel I sort of thrive in. And so when the opportunity to work more in recruitment in more recent years and then set up a recruitment business with Harriet, I was really excited excited, to... to So you started in HR and Mm -hmm. then went into recruitment. So your perception of recruitment must have been interesting from coming from that side and then going into recruitment. Yeah, and I've worked in lots of different industries doing HR. So I've worked in um, hospitality and leisure sectors, so sort of hotel companies, and then I moved into financial services and banking. So those two worlds are very different anyway. How recruitment is done is very different in those worlds and the type of people you're recruiting yeah. is, is very varied. And how did you get into uh, recruiting Harriet? Um, I temped at Michael Page years and years ago just as a PA. Okay. Um, did some travelling and then actually started as a teacher but someone I met at Michael Page started their own um, <laughs> recruitment business so I um, was asked to go and join him when he started about 15 years ago and I decided however much I love teaching it wasn't paying enough so I'd mm. go and join him so I kind of fell into it um, and I actually started there as more of a support for, for really? the other co-founder um, and then just really really enjoyed it mm. um, and that's so what was I your perception of recruitment at that point um, I knew that it was cut f- quite cut throat because okay. obviously Michael Page being very big and international mm. um, and I was in the city office you had to high targets and I it was kind of the periphery of my job I didn't really yeah. get involved but I heard about it and I saw you know, what a good biller and consultant was, was in their eyes and what are not so good. Um, but I actually am a relationships-based person, so mm. I was never looking at recruitment like that. I was never looking at it as billings. It was more around, actually, I really enjoy meeting peop- people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and then okay. fell into Oakleaf, which is my old company. and have Where we met. Up. Yeah, okay. so to sort, of, to sort of set the scene then, so the both of you worked in recruitment for quite a long time yeah fair to say 20 years yeah 20 years mm-hmm. so then so then both of you met at a, a recruitment agency called Oatley yeah right um and you worked at Oatley for I was there in total just over 10 years 10 years and then and then did you then went internal didn't you you said yeah so I was there for eight years I had twins then moved into EasyJet in house role yeah. for two and a half years yeah um and then wanted to work more flexibly so rejoined Oatley f- um to start the flexible working desk with Jane okay cool and then that led you then to the point where you are today with trapeze. Yeah. And for you then, Jane, just so then everyone understands. So that, that's how you got to this point. And then yourself, Jane, how did you get to... So you started in HR, yeah. worked with a numerous mm-hmm. amount of mm-hmm. industries. Um, and then you went to recruitment. So um, to wind back a few years, yeah. I um, have a family. And as my young family came along, the world of HR and particularly HR in investment banking wasn't as open-minded to how you could work in a job with sort of flexible working Mm. in mind so I happily worked there flexibly for a number of years but then when I had another child and I I wanted to work more flexibly but banking didn't enable that I thought right I'm done here I Mm. need to continue my career but I still have my home commitments Mm. so I set up myself as an HR consultant okay um, and stayed in touch with quite a few recruiters in case some roles came along that I could do flexibly sure. alongside my consulting. And I um, wanted to sort of do more in the world of flexible HR mm. recruitment. The seeds were being sown back then. And I approached Oakleaf and, and had a chat with them about how setting up a desk, desk which Harriet and I then did together, mm. could be something that they should be doing. Someone should be doing more about it. And they were very receptive to the idea. And that's where my recruitment focus sort of properly 
kicked mm. in. And how that long was, did you do that desk again for? Um, I was there for two and a half years doing it, and Jane, I think, for three and a half. Yeah. Okay, and then after that, you then made the decision to start Trapeze. We were really enjoying what we were doing, and it became apparent that actually probably um, in the part-time kind of flexible space, we didn't have a lot of competitors, and we mm. thought, why not go and do this ourselves okay. and do it our way? All right, so just to be clear as well, what you guys and have done since up until that point, up until now, and is completely dedicated to the flexible and part-time niche the four and a half years that Jane was at Oakleaf and the two and a half years I went back to, we dedicated to the yeah. part-time flexible yeah. market. Yeah, and that's what you do now, right? Yeah. And then, and is it in different sectors or is it just...? Across sectors, um, SMEs, startups and some more established businesses, yeah. Okay, cool. So before we, before we sort of unpack what, what's been going on, because how long has Trapeze been going on now for? 15 months. 15 months, okay. Before we, because I'm sure you've learned a lot along the way <laughs> in that, in that uh, short time... I'd be. I'd love to sort of um, get some of your perspectives on, um, I guess, leading up to that point because I think that both of you've been on a really interesting journey, right? In terms of being internal, it's been an agency for nearly well over, over a decade, right? Um, and yourself going from HR background, etc. So, I guess just to help me understand the people listening, the both of you then have you had experiencing managing teams, building desks, etc. Is that Tip what you did over that time in the agency world, or was it not? Was that more yourself, or no? I I didn't ever choose to manage a team. Really? Um, I think the opportunity wasn't there when I was first at Oakleaf because we were still growing. Um, and then when I came back, I selfishly wanted to work flexibly, and therefore I don't think that yeah, always yeah, comes hand sure. in hand with managing teams. So the, so the both of you've always focused on building for your own recruitment desk, building your own relationships, and building your own desk individually. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. And, okay then, so why, why don't we then, because I think um, it will be really useful when we start talking about trapezes, Let, let's focus on um, the time where the both of you were building up that particular market, the both of you. So probably the most common thing I get asked around is, um, Hisha, my, my biggest challenge or what I'd love to get advice around through the people that come on, on the show is um, people building desks, people building client relationships and um, business development ultimately. So I guess... What's been your experience with that and how have you typically foc focused and um, executed that in your career? I think this needs to be based... <laughs> no, no, go, go, go. But this needs to be based on trapeze because I think we were um, yeah. at Oakleaf, it was PSL clients. Okay. So that, that wasn't something we built up. We were, if you like, lucky in inverted commas to get a client that we already had at Oakleaf that then thought we might look at the flexible market. So trapeze is the area where we actually have built up a desk. Okay, that's interesting. So why don't we, instead then, why don't we talk about because that may sound easy, but I'm sure there's still an element of work, tactic, strategic element to expand an account to say, well, actually, we're currently doing this for you. Have, how open would you be for us to do this for you, et cetera, right, or not? Well, I think one of the reasons we've done what we've gone and done and set trapeze up is because we felt quite constrained okay. by the environment that we were in, which is fair enough. We were in a big recruitment consultancy, very well known, highly thought of, but there were parameters around what we were able to able do to or do. we had scope to do or budget to do and the freedom to do it in a different way on our own meant we could talk to anyone we wanted to we could mm. break down the doors and go and talk to private equity clients venture capitalists new new growing business sectors that to be frank a lot of the recruiters out there aren't haven't even scratched the surface sure. of and so that was what was never negatively but just burning away of we could, yeah, do, okay. we could do so much okay, more. Okay, so was it more of like, obviously there's always the the already existing relationships, so they, there were decisions made where you could try and speak to them or whatever. And that I, I don't know whether it was we couldn't, it's just our day-to-day -day job didn't lead it to that. To yeah. that. Really? And so now we, we've got the freedom to speak to who we want. When we want. Mm. And okay. And well, let's about talk what we want. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's talk about that then, if, if, that, if that's the case, because I think a lot of people get a lot of value out of that. So how... How have you gone about building the, the client bank over the last 15 months? So inevitably, our network has come into play, and that's been built up over the years that Jane's had an HR and I've had an HR recruitment sure. and in-house. Um, I think part of that, and this is where I, you know, if I may be so bold to say, my strength is in building relationships. So mm -hmm. um, at the time, you know, I might have had a job 10 years ago that I filled, but I always filled it with the best of my ability and really got to know those candidates. And now we're seeing those candidates come back as clients. clients mm -hmm. and, and as always one does, you follow your recruiter. So you might, they might work for a recruitment mm -hmm. firm, but you don't go to a recruitment firm because of that. 
um, firm, you go because you've got a great person there. Sure. Ordinarily. So that's how we've built some of our business up. And I think um, we've recognised that we're, we're two people, we've got different strengths, capabilities, sure. skill sets, and Harriet's recruitment sort of expertise in my sort of HR brain and the fact that I've worked in different sectors. And we've got some pretty extensive networks between us mm. that we've very sort of openly gone to and and met with and marketed our proposition to, and they've been very receptive to it. And even if they haven't been able to help us with giving us a new sort of head of HR role, they've probably known someone who can. Yeah, yeah. So, it, so it's you've really leveraged your existing networks. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I think there's something to be said for doing a job well. So we take a really consultative approach with um, clients. A lot of our clients are in the startup space mm. or SMEs who could have, you know, even 200 people and still haven't had any HR presence at all. Mm. Um, so quite often it's let's go in and have an exploratory chat about what HR actually does. And obviously people have an idea, but they don't really understand the strategic element or the kind of, this is how your business can really thrive with someone in the people space. Mm. Um, so a lot of it is groundwork we put in, even some of them was 12 months ago, 13 months ago. Um, and we're just actually yesterday, a client we met months ago has come back with an opportunity for us. So we, we put the groundwork in as this is what it looks like. And a lot of these entrepreneurs are very young, so they haven't actually even worked in probably more than one or other business. Mm. So it's that consultative, this is what we can do for you. This is what HR can do for you. And then we leave it with them. And a lot of what we've found we end up doing, as Harriet just said, is educating our clients sure. about what HR can do and what an experienced three-day-a-week HR person can add in terms of value to your business because people just think of process and procedure, but there's a whole gamut of other things, employee engagement, culture, mm. you name it, change pieces mm. that, that HR can do, which some some business owners have no no concept of what HR can do. It helps also that our backgrounds are, I've been in-house, but Jane's an HR specialist, so we actually know our market really well in really terms well, of yeah. what HR can offer and the types of people out there. And I guess what, what you were touching on there, which I think is really interesting, have you always had a long-term mindset and approached building relationships that way? Do you get what I mean? Because I think that's where a lot in today's day and age, right? If I don't get something now or in the, in the first three months of this relationship, then it's a lot easier then for that relationship to fall off the cliff where it, then it's not coming to, well, actually, no, we did. Yeah. Did, did you get what I mean? Have you always, like, how... It yeah. sounds really naff. I think I'm just like that as a person. Really? I'm really Fair invested enough. in people. If I go out, no one has dinner parties anymore. <laughs> if you go out and you meet someone, I'm actually genuinely, as my friends say, quite nosy and annoying because I like the detail, but I'm genuinely really? interested in their lives. Yeah. Um, and I think that transports into work as well. I think that's just how I am, and Jane, you are, as an individual. Um so yes, it's it's. I've never thought of it as longer term relationships. I actually really enjoy getting to know Quite people. Quite intuitively, yeah. yeah. And I just I like getting to know people. And the cl candidates or clients that I'm speaking to now, someone phoned up yesterday, and I helped her in her first HR job ten years ago. You know, she's that remembered mental, me, which is it? amazing. Like, no, and actually, yeah. I have to be really cycle, yeah. honest. Mm. I don't remember everyone because they get married. They, you know, we all change and we go through a lot in ten years. But I love the fact that they've obviously remembered me. Mm. Um, if, you know, and come back. Ju just to break that down, because clearly you've done that quite intuitively, which I think is amazing, but someone listening right now who may not be quite naturally good at that, and, yeah, what would, what would your advice be to someone that... Because you're clearly intentionally or naturally leaving a, a mark on that person or really uh, going above and beyond for that person, which means they will come back in 10 years. Like, what would you say are the core key things that people can actively, consciously do to hopefully help that happen or start building that do you get what I mean? Yeah, I, so first of all, I think there's two types of recruiters. There are probably many others, but in my, <laughs> view, in my view, there are two. One who wants to make a lot of money and move on fast, or mm. just make a lot of money, and the other that wants to make money, but actually, um, and it doesn't mean to say the first type doesn't care, but actually really cares about what they sure. do. Um, and I think if it doesn't come naturally to you, but you do want to do a brilliant job and you're in it for the long term, then you just really have to think about who you're speaking to, how you speak to them, and and care. So that means mm. going back with feedback if they're not right for something, sure. taking the time of day. And we we can't go back to everyone, obviously, and nor can Jane and I. So you have to pick and choose. But as long as you put yourself in that person's shoes and think, I'm a job seeker at some stage in my life, so this is how I'd like to be treated. I'm a client, and I want to make sure that the um, recruitment consultancy is representing my brand and me properly. Then actually, that goes some way into building a relationship mm. and a trusted relationship. To do the right thing. Mm. There are some words, we're very, very values driven okay. as a business and, and 
I think words like integrity and passion are overutilized sure. and, and not understood at all. So we don't use them about ourselves, although I know I've got passion for what I do sure. and I've got buckets of integrity, as has Harriet. But I think what we're trying to do is bring back a very human element into the recruitment experience mm. for our clients, be they candidates or the employer of the, the, the job that we're hoping to fill for them. Um, and just flipping everything on its head and, and being down to earth, honest with people. Mm. Um, the hardest calls to make are to candidates who you really wished had got the oh, job, yeah. but you have to deliver some pretty blunt feedback. Yeah. We package it as best we can, but we're really sorry. The reason you didn't, you weren't successful. And, and how many yeah, recruiters and don't bother? Learn, we want them to learn from that. We did have one candidate who just get, kept getting knocked back because um, she came across as really aggressive. And actually, that's feedback I've had myself in terms of how I talk to people sure. at home, you know, and at work kind of mm. thing. Um, and I really wanted to give her that feedback because she'd had it from four jobs and she's got brilliant CV and excellent experience. But if that and that's not something she can necessarily change, but she needed to be aware of it. Sure. So we had to package it. I'm sorry, we had to give it to her. We couldn't package it up as, you know, oh, it's something else. We had to say your CV is brilliant. You've got the experience, but you are coming across yeah. this way. And, and she think, was thankful. Yeah. yeah. And I think to tie back into what you're saying there and that person coming back to you, I think it's those difficult conversations that if you're willing to have now, that person will be grateful for yeah. a year's time, two years' time, and three years' be, time. And you'll be remembered. We do small things to sort of remind our candidates, placed candidates get a, a gift from us when they mm. start in their new job. It's not... It's just a well done. We're so pleased that we've found you a great opportunity that enables you to work in the way you wanted to work flexibly, etc. And as a nice little, so little touches, little human mm. touches yeah, no, that, like that. That, that the bigger, bigger companies probably can't do. But mm. we're we're small and we never plan to be too big. We have vision and. But ambition. you know that's that's the the type of experience you're going to create and yeah. have a point of difference, right? I mean, it's and so then, saturated reputation is key for us mm. um we want to be remembered for being having giving people a really positive engaging experience that's down to earth straightforward and and just honest. says it how it is and is honest integrity. yeah integrity <laughs> such a good word and i think just to um again trying to make it as practical as possible for people listening when you said around that client who came back recently and you actually had a meeting with them uh, a while back like how how do you then structure that sort of process or structure it in your daily, weekly plan to make sure that that does happen, if that makes sense? You get what I mean? In terms of cultivating these relationships, mm. that long-term mindset, business development, leveraging network, like how does that typically form then in a typical day in your world? Um, so we feel quite um, strongly about adding value to what our sort of what we do as recruiters that it's not just about selling and the idea of them hiring through us um so all the little value add things we have some sort of thought leadership events that we host and trying to get people to come and um have a round table discussion about well yesterday we had one on mental health okay um and got a group of really well-informed senior hr people business owners entrepreneurs talking around a table for an hour over breakfast around what, what can we do to make a real difference. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and that doesn't cost us very much money. It costs people time. And people made some good connections in the room. And we've heard that people are having lunch and coffee together next week. Sure. met in the room. So we're adding value to that day for those people. And we'll do another event in that, a couple of months. That's sharing time. our network, isn't it, as yeah. well? And so value, value add initiatives that are... So, you, so you've also implemented and strategically, obviously because you're paying forward and you want to put these people together and you're trying to actually make a positive difference, which is what you're about. But also then, I guess, for, let's say, client X that you spoke to 12 months ago, well, in between that, you can actually contact that person and say, well, we actually have an event, by the way. Yeah. And so you've created other sort of touch points. That yeah, yeah. and, and we, we end up connecting quite a few clients outside our events anyway because they might say, and, and it's maybe easier in inverted commas in the startup world because they need quite a lot of help in some mm. areas and, and inspirational ideas. So it's, it's you know, easy to say, well, have you met John Smith? Because actually he does this. And mm. So we've connected that way. Yeah. And also our coach club's been really great and that's why we set that up. We have amazing HR um, interims on our in our talent pool, but a lot of them are coaches, which is why they want to do flexible working in HR. Mm. And we were like, we've got all these people who are so talented in coaching. Why can't we offer the coaches more clients, but also offer our clients 
some coaching um, yeah, availability. Smart. So, you know, that's not a, that's not an initiative that's going to make us lose money, but it's an initiative that's going to help our clients and also help our coaching pool. Mm. No, I, th- I think that's really smart. And I guess the events piece, that's actually come up quite a lot over, over the last four. Yeah. Se- I think it's mm-hmm. quite common, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, have you always done that? Like since starting this or when you was at previ- in the previous company? We didn't or? really do a lot of it at Oakleaf because... Um, because it was, a, I guess, a business-wide thing, not just a yeah, sure. part-time not just space. Trying to, yeah. And there are a lot more people there. Um, we've done it here, but we've been able to pick the topics that are close to clients' hearts. So next month, we have one on culture, and we've got a particular client. So how have you decided on the points there? Well, because we've got a particular client on that one who wants, to, who's asked us around, how do you think I get more... Um, of this in my culture? Or how do you think I grow my culture? We've had another client having to be kind of... Um, told that she needs to hire 40% females in her mm. senior population. So how does she do that? So we had one around diversity and kind of that so sort of thing. using the conversations you're having on a Yeah, so that's, basis. again, direct help for that individual because yeah. hopefully more people will come with their thoughts on that and how they do things. Um, but it's also topic of the moment. Mm. So providing solutions to the problems that our clients face yeah. is, is exactly how we feel we can add intrinsic value to what they're doing day to day, aside from the fact that they might hire an HR person yeah, through us. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're giving them a, a solution by gathering together a clever group of people who've all got opinions, all got stuff they've done well, differently, and they can add that to the pot. After an hour of sitting around a table, we all come away with, that was a really good idea that yeah. John mentioned about what he's doing about culture in his tech startup. Mm. Um, so that's a key thing for us. And has it made you more money? Doing the events? Yeah. We haven't been doing them a, a long enough to know that. But what yeah. we do know is that, and respect isn't quite the right word, but I think we're valued or we're seen as valued members of their network. Mm. Um, next Wednesday night, we're going to see Container's House, hopefully to have a nice glass of wine, with a client that we worked with over a year ago, a PE firm, who have got a massive event. Um, and they're a private equity firm who um, have loads of portfolio businesses within their um reach yeah. mm. um, and they've invited us and I actually did email back and say are you sure we're on the list this year because we were, we came last year because we were working with you she said absolutely we'd love you there and I believe we've kept in touch with them in, in throughout the year and not for anything other than we've built yeah, a relationship sure. with them so we want to keep that um, and we've asked them if they want to come to our events we've offered our coaching which is actually for the next couple of months kind of a free taster session um, and we and when we did work with them we really really spent time going into the nitty-gritty of what they were looking for what HR could do and that sort of thing. And it, actually, we've never placed with them. They've got an interim in, which they found through their own network, but they want us to hire when she leaves at the Christmas. So, um, you know, those are the sorts of things that we're really um, valued for, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And just by the fact we've been asked back shows that. Yeah, no, I think the, the reason why I ask that is because at the end of the day, typical recruiter listening, right? It's like, yeah, these events sound great. A lot of people do them, but yeah. like, how is it going to yeah. pe- affect gonna my recruitment desk? You yeah, know what I mean? Same thing with marketing, same thing Absolutely. with events. But that, that, then it's a long-term game. Mm. I know yeah. it's not a game, but you are you working mean. for the future. You're not yeah. working for the now. And then, No, totally. And I think as well, if you, and I think that's got to be the mindset when you do do initiatives like this. Do you get what I mean? If you're going in with a simple mindset of, right, how is this going to affect my billings this year? There's a very high chance that you may make a decision on that basis that you may not get the best people in the room. Or whatever. Do you get what I mean? And I think that that's the way you should approach it as and, well and with Jane, these things. And, we, and you know, I did say to Jane this week, um, or last week, we've worked for four days and I haven't done what I would call any recruitment. Mm. And Jane said, but this is BD, it's all BD. And, it, and mm. it absolutely is. But it's hard to see when you're looking at your bottom line thinking, what have I bought in this quarter? Yeah when you're not actually working on roles for the now. So we've got a few roles on now, but we obviously haven't got as many as we'd like because everyone would want sure. more. But actually all the things that we're doing, all the initiatives we're doing are paving the way for the potential pipeline. And if they're not next month, they might be next you know, month after sure. that. So Okay, mm. that's really interesting. So have the both of you always... So you did a bit of consultancy before. Mm. Have the both of you always wanted to have your own business? Never even thought I would do it. Really? <laughs> have you? Well, well I, 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 I was kind of forced into doing it because my options were limited sure. to work, to continue in my HR capacity, continue with my career, and quite ambitious about it, and juggle home priorities. Sure. So I was slightly forced, forced into, into becoming yeah. a consultant. I enjoyed it, and it gave me loads of flex. Yeah. But um, it's much more fun doing it with sure. someone else. Really? So, like, would you... So, thinking back just now in this short 15 months, like, if you, would you go back and do anything differently? 
Yeah, yeah loads. Lots, lots of things different. But I do believe, and you hear it all the time from people who start businesses, um, we've learned from them. I wouldn't say they've made us stronger, <laughs> like people say, <laughs> but we've learned and it's made us more cautious in other areas. Yeah. Mm. What, what would you say is... The, what, when I say when you think about that, what's the sort of thing that comes to mind <gasps> straight so away? In good ways and bad ways, we tried to mirror what we knew. So that was getting a system in place quite quickly. Mm. Well, we hardly use our system, and we've paid a lot for it from day one <laughs> for both of us to have. We know account. all our candidates. I so don't need to look it up on a. You system. don't tell me you have some like weird black notebook that you no but we should probably should have done or an excel spreadsheet <laughs> to save us money so that's been one yeah. i think also just being aware that we aren't a big business who's established so things are going to be different and with the highs and lows of recruitment anyway mm. you just kind of have to be aware of that but i i can honestly say that i've changed as a person i i never thought i would do business i didn't have a lot of confidence around this sort of thing Why not? um because i guess until you try you don't know how good you're going to be and i don't mm. like failing <laughs> Yeah. No one does really like yeah, failing. Yeah, yeah, of course. But I also, and I don't know if it's an age or a stage of life, got to the stage where I'm like, I've got quite a few more years to work, but I've already, I'm 42, so I've got yeah. some years under my belt. Um, and if I'm going to do it, this is the time. Yeah, because I guess there's a lot, a lot of people, if you were sitting in a, I don't know, anywhere, maybe some friends, similar age, they'd be like, oh my God, why the hell would you do that at this age? It's quite, I, I feel like it'd be quite easy to just say that to you, and it'd be like, why would you do that? No, just stay working, you're employed. I knew I wanted to leave my last business, and, and actually Jane um, mitigated the risk by saying, if it doesn't work out, you can get another job. And, I, and I'm, mm. I'm not cocky, but I know that I'm good at what I do, and I care. So I think if you're good at what you do, and you mm. have a passion for it, then you will get another job. Mm. And I you know I think that's a great question to ask yourself, isn't it? Like, what is the worst that could happen? Yeah, and if it all goes, then we'll find another job. But mm. it's it's going really well, yeah. and it's it's fun. And um, work is fun. Yeah, and never I think dull. that's mainly. mainly. <laughs> it's certainly never dull. But no, and I, I really think that's got for me. I think personally, that has that's got to be the objective, isn't it? I think, especially in, in recruitment, it, it is a very unforgiving job. So like, if you, even when you're doing well, you're not that happy or that pleased, yeah. then it's, it's never good you enough. should be looking, yeah, do you get what I mean? So, so you did mention the, the highs and lows there. I guess you said you've changed as a person and these types of things. I'd love to understand a bit more about, have you had to cultivate more resilience? Have you had to have different conversations with your family because you're having to work a bit? I don't know. Do you get what I mean? What are some of the... <laughs> <laughs> um, I know I seem to be doing a lot of the talking, no, which well, is unusual because we normally share it. Um, <laughs> I'll interject. Um, so my resilience has always been something I've found difficult and that's been picked up in my career um, really? in the past. And I take everything to heart and I wear my heart on my sleeve. Mm. Um, but I think growing, I've grown as a person because I've learned to take... Um, things on the on the cheek or whatever the expression on the chin, is on the on chin, the chin yeah. um cheek in this circumstance <laughs> and, and move on and actually i've kind of enjoyed seeing myself grow which sounds really weird That's quite amazing. like quite like airy fairy but i i have um the conversations with family and friends yeah my husband's constantly saying you're working every evening blah 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 and i and i do and i don't like it and we've promised ourselves that we won't do it after a certain time of the evening um and we've got commitments elsewhere either with family or you know palaces or whatever it might be so mm. we don't sit at our desk and work but equally that means that if we want to leave at 4 30 to go and pick our kids up from club early or whatever then we can do that because mm. we know we can always log on for an hour mm. later in the evening mm. but my resilience has definitely changed and grown how, how have you cultivated that then like have like you said you said well, it's airy fairy or whatever, but I think what you're talking about is self-awareness, right? You notice that, well, actually, the, the resilience is something that I did always have to work on. That's something that now I've really had to swallow and get better at. So have you, I don't know, included something uh, in your daily habits? Or hmm. I don't know, have you done anything that have, has cultivated that? Or has it literally been, well, it's, actually... It's really little things. And, and this is going to sound bizarre to people who don't know me, but <laughs> lady on the train dropped some litter the other day. And I would ordinarily have got really annoyed with that and just really? sat there and, and thought to my mind, why is she dropping litter? If everyone dropped litter, this train would be covered in litter. Mm. I said to her as I got off the train, would you like me to pick that up for you and pop it in the bin? She said, oh, no, 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 I'll do it in a minute. And she may well have been doing it, but she dropped it and kind of hidden it under her chair. Now, it sounds ridiculous, but for me, I was like, oh my God, I've just said something I wanted to say for ages. Yeah. So that is all those little things are making me grow in confidence. And that's mm. not a resilience in the workplace example, but it, what it means is I know that I can do things and they don't have to come out in the wrong way or that I can have the confidence to follow through with things. And if they're not well received, she could have told me to F off or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was prepared for that because I thought I've got to try it. Mm. I've got to try. Mm. And the same in, in work. We have to try things. If they don't work out, the coach club might not work. Something, another initiative might not work. But unless you try, you're not going to know. 
Mm. And I think the openness that we have as co-founders of a business with one another has grown immensely in yeah. the last 15 months. We knew each other pretty well to start with. We are good friends. We've got lots in common. We're also very different. But we're coming at this from the same perspective of how we want to run the business or how we want the business to be positioned. Um, and we have a very open line of communication we don't hold any grudges we bicker we spat mm. we fall out like sisters and we it's done move mm. on no time for baggage and which in a bigger organization where you might fall out with yeah, him on yeah. that desk because you don't agree with his approach with the client that we're working on together we just say it to each other and we're it's done move on that's next. we're passionate about things yeah, yeah. has it been it's, like that from day one or have you had to what have you had to implement like i don't know do you know what i mean have no you had to, we haven't I don't think we have. We, it's just been like that. Yeah. It's just yeah. been quite natural. That, And how much has it helped the both of you that you're doing it together, do you think? Oh, massively. Yeah. Really? Couldn't, I, couldn't, I wouldn't want to do this with anyone else. Really? I couldn't do it on my own. And so it's... Why, it's why is that, do you think? Like, what, what's, what's so unique and powerful and special about doing it with another person? Well, recruitment can be quite lonely, as we all know. Mm. Um, and you can work really hard and something doesn't pull off. Yeah, Equally, sure. you can not do much work on something and it comes off and you're like, wow. Um, so I think, especially if you're running your own business, you're never sure where the next money's coming from. In a, if you're employed by someone, you know you've got a base salary. Sure. So you, you almost know what you're yeah. going to be doing month for month. Um, so that's that's a you know big pressure for anyone, whether you've got family or not. And you can bounce ideas off someone. You I, can get a sense check. I think our yin and yang of complementary skills as we've mentioned sort of earlier is is quite unique in a recruitment sort mm. of sense because it's quite unusual to have an in-house recruiter who's got a lot of agency experience paired with someone who's this not subject matter expert yeah. but has worked in the field you're recruiting into so when we line up in front of a client that's pretty compelling mm. and what we then say because we know we're good at what we do is makes it even more compelling and so we know we're good we, without yeah. sounding arrogant no I'll go you we, we know we've got substance and we'll be honest with people and we'll tell them mm. straight and no no I think look obviously I me recently started my own business it's on my own I think what what's also great about that is the accountability piece as well right so you're saying about I'm gonna have sometimes we'll work late and stuff like that but it's not just on your shoulders it's actually someone else mm. it's everything else right which I'm sure can only help the drive mm. and the decision making mm. and, and these types of things right but we can have an idea this afternoon and start doing that yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, that is the cool thing. You don't have to get it sanctioned by some high... We might chat to the husbands or let them in on it <laughs> briefly, but we'll probably tell them in a couple of months' time when it's yeah. been going for two months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, it's that freedom to make decisions and to say that I'm not happy with that, that's working, can mm. we tweak that? So I'd really like to um, dive into the flexible working piece because I, I think it's such a... Um, I don't want to say buzzword, but it's so easily used and said <coughs> these days... Before we do that, I'd love to get your point, because you were just touched on it there in terms of um, internal experience, you've got agency experience, et cetera, et cetera. Like, <clears throat> what, what's your approach now? And I guess what I'm trying to think about is people listening, and even when I was a consultant on the agency side, like, there's always that sort of friction between internal recruiters and agency, right? So, like, I guess people listening who do come up against that, who have always got that constant balance of, should I just go to that line manager, but internal recruiters hmm. tell me not to, and we've got a good relationship, I don't want to um, obviously damage that, et cetera. Like, what's been your sort of whole experience from being internal to agency, and what have you learned that has enabled you to make sure that you get the internal the internal recruiter? Did you get what I mean? What, what, have, what do you think about that? <clears throat> so I have always... Um some might say played by the book or being a bit boring. But even if I know um, the hiring manager really well, I would always then loop back in the recruiter or the HR person internally mm. because there's absolutely no point mm. um, bypassing them because at some stage you will come up against them as your main client yeah. um, mm. in the near future or even at that company. So again, that's about the relationship piece and the respect. So as I was just saying, what I'd love to get your thoughts on, be it when you was an internal recruiter or when you're an internal like what do you think are the common mistakes recruiters make in terms of get damaging that relationship? Because I'm sure you'd have experienced them because you've been in the side, you always was mindful of them playing by the book or whatever, but then going internal, like what were the common... <laughs> the, the, the flip side, so the other side is when I was internal and we use agencies, which wasn't um, 
that much, yeah. they would go straight to line and say, but I know mm. James really well and I he's told me to send CVs. And I'll say, but that we have a process and that's a thing. Everyone has a process, whether you're an agency or in-house, you have mm. a process to follow. So if someone's bypassing that process, then there's no trail, um, you know, there's actually no fairness in a sense because mm. other candidates haven't mm. been able to get a look in. So I guess it's, it's about giving everyone an opportunity. So... Um, I don't think it works to play the short game and try and get in there quicker. Mm. Mm. But the common mistake would be, well, actually, no, I, I know Harry, and he yeah. said it's fine. And she says I'm great. And yeah. Yeah, 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 but and then all of a sudden, the internal person probably got their back up a bit then because you sort of stepped the line and, as you said, not respected their process, which is their process. Yes, and quite often, that role might not materialise to anything because, you know, you've got people to get sign off with and everything yeah. else so if they've gone in because james thinks that he's got a job but he hasn't actually gone through the proper routes you might end up doing all the work as an agent yeah, and actually no. not have anything done so i yeah. just think it's always even if james has asked you to work on it you then loop in the recruiter and say just so you know and that's a conversation for the internal recruiter and the client to have not yeah. for them necessarily to have with you yeah. and from an when i was on this sort of hr side of things and that happened regularly the recruiter would go straight to the line manager in the bank I was mm. working in and say, well, I went to school with Jeremy. I want to send my <laughs> CVs directly to Jeremy. And I was like, well, Jeremy's admin is not very good. Yeah. He will lose your CVs. We will have no trail of what's yeah. gone where. And to be frank, if you upset me on this, then we'll just bla like we'll blacklist you and we won't use yeah. you as a recruiter. And you then tell your boss that that's happened. Yeah. So I, mean, I suggest you play it's ball. It's a bit of respect, isn't it, for mm. the in-house recruiter? Mm. I, mean, I, I think it is. I think it's, you said in a nutshell, respect the process. It's their yeah. process. It's their... So, but I guess, and I guess just to, just to wrap, wrap that up then, like if I'm a recruiter right now listening and I'm just really struggling to get this internal or the internal team, HR, whatever, on my side, what's like the go-to? To try and get these people on your you side. You have to meet them first of all. Really? And just really gun for a meeting. I think if you're on a large PSL list, you know, like preferred supplier list, and they can't meet every agency, then you know there is always that problem because they don't want to spend their days meeting agency. But you've got to differentiate yourself and to grow a relationship. You either need to meet them or spend time talking to them on the phone mm -hmm. and getting to understand how they work and and telling them a little bit about how you work and why mm. you're different to the next person. Okay. And and how or how you would like the recruiter to behave differently how, how can we be different to a b and mm. c next so ask agency? those types of questions yeah that's really interesting and, and try and find a hook that's going to differentiate you against others but i think ultimately have a long-term mindset double down on the relationship respect the process yeah. and just keep at it and i think then it's about hoping that will lead to some sort of window of opportunity where then you've got a put your money where your mouth is and actually be what you said that you were going to be and then, yeah. did you get what I mean? Yeah. That sort of makes sense, okay. Mm. So flexible working then, the reason why I say it's really really common and these types of things is, so what I do with people that I work with, um, when we, uh, one of the things that we do is um, really think about their target audience before we get them creating any content, right? So I would say one of the most common challenges for different sectors that I've worked with, their candidate that they're trying to attract and engage with online is flexible working and more and more candidates that they deal with and speak to want flexible working. It's mm -hmm. becoming more and more important to them, et cetera, et cetera. Why do you think that is in the, in the night, like, uh, as a whole? That people are searching for flexible working. Mm. Because life is so busy. So there's two different types mm. of people, if you ask me. The, um, the guys coming up, the millennials, which I can never say, um, who don't just want one job now. They want to be able to have some side projects or mm. do a little bit of a portfolio business area, which is yep. what we see. Yep. Um, or there's people at a certain stage of life who actually think I've worked really hard five days a week and as we grew up with kind of eight to six or whatever it might mm. be, and I want to do something different. So they might have elder care responsibilities. They might mm. have childcare. They might want to do yoga. They might just actually want to spend their day off riding. We've got quite a few candidates who do exercise on their day off and mm. write books, some of them. So I think life is now um, entwined so much with work and mm. home life. It's not two separate things that mm. people actually see it as if I can get a bit of flexibility in my job. It doesn't necessarily mean part-time, but it can mean agile working. Then it'll enable me to do other things. Mm. And would you say that typically, again, quite broad, but that could typically enable people to be have a bit more happiness in their life? And do, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And also um, with technology nowadays, as we all know, it's, mm. it's not a new thing. You can work from anywhere. So mm. if you've got a long commute or even if you haven't, you could save that. Um, money or time on commute and maybe go for a run in the morning or actually mm. just have a coffee quietly in your house or whatever it might be but you're not always having to run out the door mm. for something mm. so you gain two hours back ten sure. you know how how realistic is this in recruitment 
if you if you only need to look you only need to look around to see that to try and be attractive to potential recruiters mm. um, agencies are offering all kinds of things unlimited holiday flexibility working mm. from mm. home no core hours so I do think it's um, realistic when I um, was in my old business in the early days I there used to be a lot of clock watching from my manager and from me he would be waiting for six o'clock until I could leave and I'd be waiting till six o'clock because I'd done all my stuff and I was ready to mm. go um, you know I was the highest biller on some of those occasions, but I'd done my work and I was ready to go. So I don't think the hours you work necessarily take to how good and successful you are. Mm. I think if you're sensible and you want to do a good job, then that is mm. uh, and, irrespective of the hours. And when we talk to clients today, yesterday, tomorrow, where we go in and see them, we encourage clients not to think about hours and days. Think okay. about output. Interesting. What do you want this person to achieve in, in a day or in a week? And, and the project that needs to be completed. And, and you have to judge people on their performance. And, and this is my HR brain obviously mm. kicking in as well. Um, not about whether someone did nine to six, yeah. five days a week, because they could have been doing nothing in those hours mm. or very ineffectual work or very unprofitable work mm. for the business. But if you judge people on what they produce and deliver, and how they come across to clients in those meetings mm. and because they're happier because they've got a slightly shorter day today because they get to go home and mm. walk their dog or yeah no that's really i really like the way that you put that and i guess how what would you say is the typical sort of challenge or pushback a typical business owner would give you or give me if i'm saying look i'd, I'd love the opportunity to have a bit more flexible like what do, what is, do you think is a typical challenge for a business owner that's sort of holding them back from going nah, i'm not sure i want them to be at the desk all day like i'm not do you know what i mean what's a I typical it's just their their preconceived perception. sort of ideas or how they you had to work and it's yeah. a generational thing mm. um the guys and girls that we speak to who are in these new age businesses tech sure. high growth startups private equity backed new world sectors they, they, everyone there expects to work flexibly. It's yeah. no, it's not. So it's the standard expectation. Yeah. It's a perception. It's the more traditional financial services, yeah. investment banking, legal, accountancy, where everyone always works Monday to Friday in, in our organisation. It's it's a little bit more of an alien concept. They're missing out on talent. That's yeah. our mm. biggest thing. There is a massive talent pool, which is one of the main reasons we started this. There's a massive talent pool of uh, candidates who want to work differently. Women, men, all ages, all shapes or sizes yeah. who want to work differently. But because... Um, they're not offered opportunities. It doesn't they're missing out. Yeah. Cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, no. I absolutely love that, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. With that just thinking back to so I recruit in the insurance sector, and yeah, as soon as someone says to you, "Oh, I can only do four days a week," straight away it's like, "I can't do anything with that person." Then no, and, and it's you so go into true. The, you get put into the too difficult to help box. Yeah, totally. And I was that candidate when I was leaving the bank where mm. I decided to go to consultancy from because I just sort of oh hi Jane sort of consultant on mm. the phone talking to Jane Middleton who's a candidate we like her she seems quite decent quality as an HR person the minute I said I'm really looking for three days oh we oh, haven't had a three-day job on for, for, for years yeah. <laughs> and, and this was 10 years ago the world yeah, yeah, has yeah. changed immeasurably and yeah. in our time just doing trapeze it's it's come on and mm. um, the dial is shifting yeah and these new businesses that are promoting it that it's not unusual to be enabled to work more flexibly mm. that's great that's pushing the dial even what more. i'd love to get your um perspective of and i guess advice for people listening like if i'm listening right now and i i've, I've done recruitment for a while and I'm more than capable of, yeah, being responsible for working at home or wh wherever it is because I'm comfortable managing my diary and, and whatever, right? How can I approach that subject with a recruit? Like, how would you go about approaching that recruitment business owner going, look, you know, I feel like you can trust me, da, da, da. Like, how can I start proposing flexible working? So a, track, a good track rac record in terms of billings mm. and, um, ab, you know, being ab being there, sorry, rather than absent helps, obviously, because if you're someone who's underperforming and you're not showing <laughs> up, then, you know, th yeah, that's, that's that trust thing. Um, and actually, Oakley for me was the prime example. I'd been there for a few years. Before I had kids, I worked four days a week. And mm. that's just because I wanted to work four days a week. I wanted a day at home, had a long commute that I wanted to just do stuff mm. on. Um, so I had a, um, a conversation and I talked about the fact that actually I would be better in terms of how I worked. I'm smarter in my work. Um, 
if they could give me a trial with four day week. Mm. Um, and obviously we had to talk a little bit more detail about how it would work, who covers my work sure. on the day off, how that might work if someone placed a job I got. Um, but actually it worked really well and I did it for a whole year and then I actually fell pregnant so I left anyway. <laughs> but you know. But I guess it's start with actually, let's be honest with, let's be honest with yourself. Have you bred trust with the person that employs you? I, I, yeah, like do, you can't just do it because it's like cool and it's what I want to do. Is it something that you really thought about and actually you're someone that when I go into that office and ask it that they're going to go, well, okay, that's fair enough because you're someone that's, yeah. Yeah, and you don't, you know, it's the same old thing. Don't bring me a problem, bring me a solution. Mm. So I had a solution that on my day off, this is how it would work. So, you know, if someone else it was going to do my work, it then they'd get a split of that or whatever. So it wasn't, okay. oh God, That's everyone else is going to have to pick up your work on your day off. They're not going to be happy with that. So effectively, they wanted me to be as good as I had been. I, I needed to actually have a day off a week now. So to be able to perform... That's what I needed. But to enable someone to cover my work so the business weren't losing out, that's what they I could give them. Mm, that's really interesting. So, okay. Yeah, because I'm just trying to think, like, I guess it's a mixture of, first and foremost, yeah, make sure you've, you've built some real trust and they trust you. And then it's like, actually put a bit of a business case together and actually think about it strategically and smart if, you, if it's something you really want. And I guess there's a real element then as well is like, is it actually something that you want? Do you know what I mean? Because I think it could be, like for my friend who's a recruiter, he works four days a week. Like that sounds great on the face of it, but what? It, what how does he actually structure his day? Like how does that actually work? Is that something that would work for me? But I guess there would be an element, as you just said there, a trial period because you don't know until you try it, obviously. But if you do try it and you work at home, it's like, oh my God, I hate it. Like I need to be running your office, blah, blah, blah. But you don't know until you try, I guess, right? And if there's a recruiter out there wanting to work more flexibly, then A, why haven't they contacted Trapeze HR? <laughs> and B, maybe think about other people in your organisation. I'm thinking female mm. uh, in particular. If there's people in your organisation who are at your stage of life, who are challenged with childcare issues, and mm. if you can afford to drop to three days, have a conversation, put yourselves together as a job share and proposition your business owner and say, could we share yeah. a job and we'll we'll come up with some and, and clever I, commission yeah. structure. And I think it, it comes back to that question, what's the worst that could happen, right? Exactly. And if you're miserable and you're going to leave anyway, mm. at least try the known trusted route of your employer Literally. that's paying your salary currently. Yeah. And it could be win-win. You keep yeah. your client relationships, you get that continuity, everyone gets continuity, yeah, yeah, yeah. known colleagues. Mm. Because um, I think that's that you touched on an um, interesting point there. So um, a while back, I did a sort of women in recruitment week, and sort of what came out of that, what came out of that, which is was really interesting, is obviously there's it's always conversation. I think it's across the most sectors why there's less obviously female CEOs and mm. all these types of things, right? And I think a real big part of that is that obviously as, as a guy, there's I don't get to a point where I'm pregnant and I've got to make the decision where it's like, okay, so I've worked my absolute socks off to get to the point where I'm in my career, but now I've got this sort of really weird decision where I've got to pick, okay, am I going to start a family or am I going to... And, they, and then in the types of organisations that I work in, it's, it's actually either or, it's not... Well, actually, you can you can do both, and we're yeah. going to. You, would that be fair to say? I think that's a yeah. real impact on why there isn't a lot of females at at the top of the food chain or whatever, because yeah. they've had to make that um, that decision. Yeah, which is, yeah, it's mental. And what I think again, we talked earlier about our job mm. is <laughs> pioneers or ambassadors of the flexing flex working movement sure. in HR. Um, um, I had a complete mind blank That's about right. what I was going to say. It would come to me, it would come to me. Um, and that our education and awareness building mm. side of what we do, um, which again, some larger recruitment owners would probably think, well, I don't want my recruiters going in, talking to clients and sort of consulting to them. I want them getting jobs on. Mm. Where, where are the jobs? Well, part of our work is almost like a social purpose element sure. to it. Whereas if we, if we can educate some business owners to recruit differently and think about, if you hire Janet three days a week to run your HR platform mm. and she's going to cost you X. 50 grand yeah. for the three days, she used to earn 120 in her old job, but she doesn't need to earn that anymore. But what you're going to get... The clout you're going to get. The yeah. clout, the experience, the credentials, yeah. the, the senior management capability is you, you can't buy that. Yeah. And if you paid 50 grand for a five-day-a-week person, you'd get a much mm. different level of no, experience. I, I, so you've sort of gone on to the point where I wanted to um, ask you about, to sort of um, finalise this. Again, thinking about 
people listening and the mm. conversations they're having because these these recruiters now will be constantly be getting the question oh is there flexible work and these types of things so then what i was just trying to say on the flip side that you sort of touched on there is if i'm a recruit right now and i've i've, I've really started to notice that candidates that i'm now working for four, four years ago didn't say flexible working is important how can i now approach that with a client that i've got do you get what i mean so i think is it coming from the education piece yeah and, Mm. And, and recruiter goes to client and says, I've got some brilliant five day a week candidates, but I'd love you to look at this four day person. Mm. They are really, really high quality. I'd say they're probably as good, if not better than the five day people. Mm. Please consider him so, or her. so is it again thinking of if I'm if I'm a recruit listening, I'm going, right, OK, so there are definitely a bank of people in my market right now that only want three days or four days. But my client hasn't told me that they're open to flexible working, but everyone's telling me they want it. Is it then? Um, yeah, making sure firstly that these people are actually good. Mm -hmm. Secondly, obviously, yeah, actually um, creating a bit of a business case and making sure that that business case is solving a real problem and talking about sort of the way that you just spoken about there. Well, actually, this person can um, achieve this for your business it, on less time and mm. she did cost this, but it should cost that. Mm -mm. So we actually really put together a really good business case. Yep. Particularly if you're in an environment where you're struggling to find the client mm. talent, then why not suggest Looking someone... To talent pool. Yeah, and you're then being a creative, imaginative, mm. entrepreneurial recruiter for Yeah, your and client. someone who isn't great is just going to go, yes, client, I can do that. Yeah. Yes, or client, no, and not push back, anyone. be consultative. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. So that, yeah, okay, that, that's really cool. Um, Conscious of time. Mm -hmm. That went quite quickly, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I absolutely love that. And I, I think that's really valuable to talk about that. And I think a lot of people will get a lot of value out of that because it's just becoming so, so, so important. So I guess just, just to finish off then, before I um, ask uh, what the both of you are excited about and these types of things, like how do you see this planning out in terms of this whole flexible working thing in the next sort of five to ten years? Obviously, you guys are banking on it quite a bit it's already changed as Jane yeah. said in the four years but even if I look back to when I wanted to work flexibly 10 years ago so my kids are eight but as I said mm. I started working um, four days a week before that um, it's already changed technology's enabled you to work wherever yeah. you want to work and however you want to work so actually being present in the office isn't so key there are some jobs and HR is one of them where you have to see your client group and get to mm. know them and build that trust so obviously there's that I need that face-to-face -face time element um, but I think it's only going to go stronger look at the world around you look mm. at the startups look at the SMEs yeah. look at the new generation coming through they don't expect to be in an office space the whole time mm. look at this office we're in co-working space mm. you know people flit and come mm. to and from they're traveling all around the world so um, flexible and agile working, and we're careful to put them both together. Part time used to be what we talked about in our old business, but flexible and agile is now because that what is the mean, difference. Just because so part time, time is probably now, two agile. or three or four days a week. So okay. set days, I work part time. Whereas agile is you can work how you want to in terms of the hours. So it could be nine to Shape three or day. ten to oh. two. It could be from home. So there's that kind of agile workforce. Um, where some offices grow so big they don't have a physical office space for everyone yeah. so there's kind of that agile hot desking and sometimes mm. you work from a home base or you work somewhere else yeah. um, and then flexible working we've got a roll on which is five days a week but there's two days from home one day you can kind of decide ah, your hours okay. so I think the whole piece is more seen as a flexible as, a, as opposed to this is straight part time mm. and also there's a part time's a little bit like the old traditional yeah. HR personnel it, 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 it does have that yeah. touch to it doesn't it part yeah time. and I've been and called it, that before I, when, I was, when I was in an in-house role oh you're the part time person off you go and, and it, it'd yeah. be a bit like what's so true it's already um, a bit of, it's a bit apologetic as well yeah it's part so true time, I'm working part of the time yeah um, yeah, it's so true. It's just <laughs> not very. Like that. It's not very in intelligent language yeah. around what someone's doing a cracking job for you. They're just yeah, not yeah, working yeah. the full week. It's so true because if you were to say to me, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm part time recruit," it's like, "Oh, you're not a serious recruiter then." Yeah, you know I mean, that well, is that's the thing what, that you just so that you hit in there in the head. That's what our clients used to say to us. Oh, well, if they're part time, are they they're giving up the ghost of it? Yeah. And we'd be like, "Oh my God, no! They've just got <laughs> other things in life that they also want yes. to focus Easy, on, yeah. so they can do this for part yeah. of the week." But most, you know, most of them are still as good, if not better, because they've got less time yeah. and they're smarter at how they work. Mm. The thing that I've noticed in the time we've been building up our sort of brand with Trapeze is. People have stopped apologising for wanting to work part time. <laughs> yeah. Don't apologise. Don't say I only want to work three mm. days. I want to work That's three so days. True. Don't give it a descriptive adjective or whatever only is, and mm. sort of try and 
apologise no. for it. No, just and the language is really important yes. as well when you use it. And that's so important. And flex, it, flex working is here to stay. Millennials, mm. Gen Z, Gen Y, whatever they're called. Um, I don't mean that flippantly, but I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Gen Z. I don't know what Coming is. out of uni, going to their first job or going from school to first job, they don't expect to have to write a, f- a formal written request for flexible working. Mm. They imagine to go into a tech firm and be told... We don't all work here all week. We work a bit from home. If you prefer to work in the office, come in. But you don't have to. We just want you to perform at your best and do your best job um, and be happy. Mm. Enjoy working here. Mm. So it's it's outdated to think that you can't... Show me a job that can't be done flexibly. Um, I I think that's the way we should think Mm. of it. So before I ask you the final question, what are the both of you excited about? What is going on in the uh, trapeze world? Excited about where it's going to go next. Yeah. As Jane said, we can come up with an idea and try it. And if it doesn't work, you know, time and a little bit of money is potentially lost. Mm. But otherwise, uh, that's that's my mantra to myself. Try it. Yeah. Try to pee. If it doesn't work, yes, it will be sad and disappointing, but you can find something else. Sure. Try the coach club, see how it works. You know, so I'm excited to see how we can push ourselves as individuals and as a business. Um, we're obviously looking to hire. Mm. So that's really exciting. Yeah. We're looking to expand. That's we amazing. don't want to be vast. We want to keep our values. And to do that, I think you need to remain at kind of, we think, An 10 or 15 workforce. people. Yeah. yeah, we want to be able to reflect what we're <laughs> yeah, looking for exactly. for clients and candidates. So we live and breathe that. I think the scale of the opportunity for trapeze, whilst we are in a quite specific sort of world um, in terms of those clients that might want to hire an HR person flexibly. If they're only 30 employees large themselves, they're not going to need a team of five in HR. But um, where this could go, how how many great recruiters mm. could come and join us over the coming years, and we could expand our reach, who knows, into other worlds outside HR mm. and provide clever solutions to businesses that that need a, a more creative mindset from their recruiter no i think it's amazing what you both do and i, I really Aww, like it and I, I do genuinely mean that i think it's do a job <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the last question i always ask people is if the both of you could communicate to every single recruiter out there they'd listen they'd take on your advice it could be a word a phrase what comes to mind be human be human i'll take that all day pretty good oh damn what am i going to say that's Mine's care, but care doesn't seem like a um, strong enough word. But <laughs> I think it's respect for what you do. These yeah. pe- these are people's careers. So, you know, all, all jobs, someone might not want a career. They might just want a really good job and they've got something to give. So you have to think of both sides. The candidate who's been looking for a job for a while, mm. who might not be right for everything, but feed that back. And the client who actually just wants a really, really good person to join their team who gets the culture and can do a job well. Amazing. I like it. Well, Harriet Jane, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much.